Hi, and welcome back to the My Secret Life project. I'm Lea Wendley, and that's Shelia Stevens. We've got a beautiful guest today. It's Mavis Korn, and Shelia will tell you a few things about her. What this is all about, you may already know. It's a series about people who had a kind of a secret life, like an internal struggle, something they really felt bad about or were uncomfortable with. And maybe they even felt like something is wrong with them. And then they started to see something different and it really helped and it changed their life. And somehow they kind of came from the darkness into the light or at least into a lighter life experience. Mm -hmm. So I hand it over to you, Shelia. Thank you, Leah. So just to give a little introduction to Mavis and how we got to know her, Leah and I, um, Leah and I were um, learning about this understanding um, at Michael Neal's Super Coach Academy. And Mavis came on one of the calls um, to speak um, during one of the master classes. And it really touched me and it touched Leah very much. And I know that anybody in any age can have the same access to wisdom, regardless of how much life experience they have. But something that impresses me each time that I listen to Mavis speak is just she has come a long way in this life and she's seen again and again um, how this understanding is at play in, in life situation. And there's just something special about that um, coming from even more life experience with this understanding. Mavis is, um, lives in the United States and she's uh, living in Minnesota currently. And she, if I'm not mistaken, maybe she'll, you'll say in a minute, but she, I think she learned this understanding directly from Sydney Banks. And maybe she'll talk a little bit about that during the interview. So we feel very honored and privileged to have her come and speak with us today. And so Mavis, I'll just hand it over to you. And with the, just with the kickoff question, like what, what was the thing in your life that you were struggling with before you came to this understanding, just to get us started? Okay, well, hi, everybody. It's good to be here. Um, I should start out telling you that I'm 81 years old and I, I can't, that's a lot to try to remember. <laughs> and so um, all kinds of things were changed, but um, as I'm listening to what you're after, I think I want to talk about how my work changed. Mm. And um, when I, uh, not long before I learned about what you what people call the three principles i i don't call them anything anymore because i've been through many many names mm. of it over the they keep changing who, whoever they is they <laughs> keep changing it and uh so i just don't call it anything i it, other than the kind of divine architecture of us mm. how we're made so um before I, before I uh, learned this, I was working, I was a single mom, three kids. I, uh, I, was, I was working at a place called the Bridge for Runaway Youth in, in Minneapolis. And I loved it there really. I, I really like kids. I just, I like being around them. I like listening to them. I like being of service to them if I can. It was a place where kids that were on the run could come and stay for safety. Mm -hmm. But we notified their parents and we kept them there for a week or so and then brought their parents in to see if we can do some help with the families. And uh, I was there for nine years. And to tell you the truth, the place was kind of like an, an emotional emergency room. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. it was there was kind of emotional chaos all the time and not just with the kids it was you know the the staff um it was it was hard work uh, because we pretty much made it hard we were all kind of operating from our education which is to find out what's wrong with everybody yeah. and to see if we can fix them and i i want to tell you that got a little old cuz i i was i was good at taking people back into the past and finding out who did what to who and how come and why and what happened because of that and diagnosing people and um and I was doing what I was supposed to do, mm -hmm. but I started feeling so inadequate and burned out mm -hmm. because I, even though I could find out what was wrong with people and try to help them not so feel so bad about what was wrong with them, um, I didn't know how to help anybody be happy. Mm. And in all my education, no one had ever mentioned how to be happy. Mm. It was always about finding out what's, what's wrong. Yeah. And that wears on you after a while. But one day, my, uh, my boss at the time, who was just a great guy, um, he, he said he got a notice from the University of Minnesota Graduate School that they were going to have a um, three PhD psychologist from Florida come and do a workshop and he had a little extra space and did, I, did he have anybody that would like to come and that. And so he asked me and I didn't I have no idea who these people were, knew nothing about it, but I got two days off work paid. That's all I cared about. That's it. That's the only reason I went. And so I got there and here are these people, one of which was Roger Mills and um, two others and I can't remember their names right now, but they had been spending time um, for some time with a man named Sid Banks. Mm -hmm. And they wanted to talk about what they had learned from him. And I was just sitting there being so glad I wasn't at work. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. and I, I started listening to him and, you know, not, I didn't think I was going to learn anything new. I had been to so many workshops, workshop after workshop at workshop, and it, nobody ever told me how to help people be happy. And I didn't know how to be happy. It wasn't that I was necessarily unhappy, but my life was pretty much of an emotional roller coaster. Maybe not as much as some, but enough so that it was tiring. Mm -hmm. And so at one point, all I heard was, it's all our thinking. Mm -hmm. Now, this was two days, but that's what I heard. Yeah. I mean, they said more than that, but that's what I heard. And I thought the top of my head was going to come off. Mm -hmm. It was like, it was an explosion that made no noise. It was, it was, oh my God, there's nothing wrong with us. It's just our thinking. Mm -hmm. And I, I honestly don't remember what else they said because that was the truth of the matter. That was, I didn't know it then, but that's all I needed to know. But it was, it was amazing. And I kept looking around to see if everybody else's top of their head came off and <laughs> it looked like that was happening. And, but, the, but I came home and my daughter was there and she's, she's, I said, I said, Wendy, I just, I just heard the, the most amazing thing I've ever heard in my life. Mm. And she said, what? And I said, uh, 
I couldn't think of anything to say. I didn't know how to tell her what I'd heard. Because mm -hmm. I could hear myself say it's all about my thinking. But I that's all I knew, and that didn't seem like a very smart thing to say at the time. So I just I realized I understood something, but I had no idea how to articulate what it was that I understood. Mm -hmm. And that didn't go away overnight, but I slept for 14 hours that night. Mm -hmm. And I woke up the next day, which happened to be a Sunday. And I thought, oh my God, I can't, I can't do work the way I was doing it before. I can't do it. I don't know what I'm going to do, but I can't do that. And I messed around with that for a most of the day and finally decided I just I knew I had a full schedule of kids and families that I needed to see I always had a full schedule there was there were never any breaks and I I thought I'm just gonna have to tell them I'm just gonna have to say I can refer them to somebody else that will continue to work with them in the way they're used to uh, because I can't I can't do, I can't do it. Mm. That's all I knew. I couldn't do it. I didn't know what I was going to do anyway. You know, I didn't know what else I was going to do, but I just couldn't do that. Yeah. So that's what I did. I started with each family and said, I, I'm kind of embarrassed about this, but I can't continue to work with you in the way I'm working with you to, to talk about what's wrong and, and, go back and I just can't do it. Now I'd like to, and they, and they'd say, well, wh wh what did you learn? And here I was again. <laughs> like I said, I said, I'm embarrassed because I don't know how to tell you what I learned, but I, I, I just can't keep doing it this way. And I'd be glad to, there's a really good people here. I'd be glad to refer you to them. And nobody took me up on it. Mm. I did that all week long. <laughs> and I thought these people were nuts. <laughs> I just thought, what is the matter with these people? They they want to they want to stay with somebody that has no idea what she's doing. <laughs> and, and I I didn't find out why I didn't find out why that was happening until months down the line because um one of the moms called me and she, boy, she was insightful. She said, I thought, I thought you might be interested to know why we didn't want to switch. Mm. Mm. I, I said, I certainly do. I, I, to tell you the truth, I thought you were all crazy. <laughs> and she, she said, because we knew you had seen something and we wanted it. And I said, how did you know that? And she said, there was just this feeling about you. There was just, there was this, this one woman said, there was this combination of bewilderment and certainty. Yeah. And I thought, that's a pretty good description of how I was feeling. Mm -hmm. Totally bewildered, but certain. Mm -hmm. And, um, I hadn't, I hadn't thought about that until just now. <laughs> it was like 50 years ago. No, 40, 45 years ago. Anyway, that turned out to be what happened with everybody else. That they, they saw something was going on, something. They couldn't describe what that something was, but they weren't going anywhere. They wanted it. Mm. And I am so grateful for them. Because I, I had been feeling like, oh man, I am letting all these people down. I'm, I'm, I'm just inadequate here. I just, I have no idea what I'm doing. I might be in the wrong business. This is, and I kept thinking about law school because I, I had some lawyers in my family, and I thought maybe that was easier. And they would tell me, no, it isn't. But yeah. you know. so I um, 
that went on and gradually these people helped me find a way to um, explain it because there weren't any books yet yeah no workshops yet um, eventually I I got to go start listening to Sid wherever he was and to tell you the truth I didn't think he made any sense at all <laughs> <laughs> it's like he's just sitting up there oh, then, whatever and, yeah. and, and my because my head got, I thought he was a really dear guy. <laughs> just a sweet, sweetie. But I had no idea what he was talking about. I just, and he had by that time written a book. I read the book. I thought, yeah, well, okay, that's, I still don't know what he's talking about. But in the meantime, my clients were asking these questions, and I had I didn't know that this is what was happening at the time, but I had discovered that if I didn't try to figure out what to say, something would occur to me. Mm. And so I would say what occurred to me, and then I and that always felt like, who said that? Somebody else said that. I didn't. That didn't. That sounds right, but I. I it was it was my first experience with. With coming from who I was mm. instead of who I thought I needed to be. Mm. It was my first experience with getting in touch with an intelligence that had nothing to do with memory. Mm. I didn't know that. Mm. I mean, I couldn't have said, oh, this is what's going on. I didn't know that. But it was, it was like being way out on a limb. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, having some sort of trust that you weren't going to fall. I didn't trust it completely. I thought any minute now, I'm going to say something so stupid that I'm just going to have to quit this business and do something that doesn't require anybody to be smart. Mm -hmm. So, but it, I don't, to tell you the truth, I wish I had a video of that whole time because it was probably hilarious. Um, but so many things started changing. I could hear, I started noticing when my head was just, mm. like there was a crowd in there and everybody was talking at once, mm. except it was just my head. Mm. And things started changing for me without my having any sense of trying to change. Mm -hmm. I just saw the biggest thing I saw. And today, today, it's still the biggest thing is that there is nothing wrong with anyone. Mm -hmm. From that time on, I never saw anybody that had anything wrong with them. I saw people who thought they did and could prove that they did, but I, I never saw anybody that actually did have anything on them. Mm -hmm. And I'm telling you, when you know that, you're in the right business. When you just know that, that that's, that, there, that our stories, our, our, our stories that we tell ourselves about what's wrong with us, and they're just stories. They're, they're just stories of the best we knew at the time. Mm -hmm. And they're stories about how we lived our life when we didn't know misery was optional. Mm -hmm. That's all they are. And there's nothing you can do about your past. You can't have a better past. There's nothing you can do about it. So why study it? Yeah. Why look for the meaning of life in a memory that's completely inaccurate? Mm -hmm. So I, it was clumsy. It was awkward. It was, uh, half the time I thought I was the exception to the rule, but there really was probably something wrong with me. Because mm -hmm. I, uh, what am I doing here? I, 
I don't know from moment to moment what I'm going to say next. I don't, I don't have a plan. I don't have a treatment plan. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't know a treatment plan from a hole in the ground. Okay. I, I, I went to my boss and the dearest, he was the dearest guy because he didn't tell me to work any differently. Mm. He said, just, just keep letting me know where you're at, but don't worry. Just do what you know and do it the best you know. Whoever says that to somebody. Mm. <laughs> so it was exhilarating and terrifying. And I was somebody who always thought I needed to have a plan. And then I needed to find out how to carry out the plan. And then I needed to carry out the plan. And then everything would be fine, right? Mm -hmm. Wrong. I, I had to, I didn't know this was happening, but I, I started having this uh, I can hardly wait to see how this turns out feeling mm -hmm. and which which kind of happens once you let go of a plan yeah and I didn't know I was doing that either until I, I just I just started noticing how how eager I was to see my clients now, at the same time this was going on um, with me and my clients, there are some people that I work with that um, I, they, they didn't like what I was doing for whatever for their own reasons. I don't know what they were, but um, so there was, there was um, kind of turmoil around me. And sometimes I get caught up in it, and most of the time I wouldn't. But um, to say that it was clumsy is the understatement of the day. Mm. So ever since, it's just been, it's just been like that that I I'll catch myself in some old habits, catch myself feeling judgmental either of myself or somebody else. I'll catch myself worrying about outcomes. I'll catch myself with this. But the difference, the difference isn't that those thoughts don't come into my head. They come into my head. The difference is I know they're just thoughts. Mm -hmm. I, can, I can feel them. Mm -hmm. Now, sometimes it takes me a little longer to notice than others. But it always ends up that I don't have much tolerance for making myself miserable anymore. Yeah. So it just takes a little bit of it to feel awful. Mm -hmm. It's uh, what it turns out to be in the long run that I don't see my clients as any different than me. That they're, I'm not some superior person. I'm not... Uh, I'm just like everybody else. I just got to learn the divine design of us. Mm -hmm. I just got to learn. I got the owner's manual. <laughs> and, and it's like everybody has the owner's manual. There isn't anybody that doesn't know what I know. Mm -hmm. They just don't know they do. Yeah. And my job is to just... If they're interested, if they're not interested, I don't want to have a job with them. But it's, it's my job to point to who they already are and that they, there's nothing wrong with them. Mm -hmm. But they're perfectly free to think there is. Mm -hmm. We can use our, our thinking in any way we want. That's what free will is. But once we, we see that we have guidance built into us mm -hmm. that lets us know when we're 
using our ability to create our experience from who we really are or when we're creating our experience from some habits of thinking that aren't in service to us that our feelings tell us that mm. because our feelings our emotions are thoughts mm. they're not a different thing from a thought they are thoughts mm -hmm. and what man-made machine is that accurate that every single thought we create is a feeling that lets us know whether it's healthy or unhealthy, mm. true or untrue, mm. in service, not so much. I used to think my iPhone was smarter than I am. <laughs> no, it isn't. We have apps that would put an iPhone to shame. <laughs> and I didn't used to know that. Mm. And it is what well, your experiences probably are not a whole lot of different than mine, that it's not, not knowing that you are made of intelligent energy that all life is, is made of. Not knowing that is a really big thing not to know. Yeah. It's like constantly trying to put a puzzle together and you don't have half the pieces. Mm -hmm. it's so innocent isn't it it's just so uh, we we just um yesterday there was a trial that you probably you guys have heard of the george floyd trial yeah. just the verdict came down yesterday and our state has our city that that I live in has been holding our breath for mm. almost a year. And as far as I'm concerned, the jury did exactly the right thing. And it's like I had the, I had this feeling of relief that at last, ordinary people of all different pigments and ages and experiences did the right thing mm -hmm. at last. Mm -hmm. and, and still I had a lot of compassion for the policeman that now has to probably spend the rest of his life in jail not because I felt sorry for him, but because he didn't know how his life could have been. Yeah. He, he was just believing every thought he thought yeah. and acting on it. Because he didn't know that was optional. He didn't know about the guidance system in him he didn't know how well he didn't know who he was yeah. and he now has to suffer from that and i have a lot of compassion for him but it doesn't mean i thought he should have been excused because yeah. of that so I'm telling you that once you realize that there's nothing wrong with anybody and, and you see the decisions they're making or what they're doing or all the mistakes they made and all the messes they have in their life, you don't see, the, see those messes and mistakes as who those people are. They're just a result of those people not knowing who they are. Mm -hmm. So you see their past and your past as just a story about them, the best they knew at the time. Mm. I had the hardest time with that, with myself. 
because I had so many habits, like most of us do, of just thinking I wasn't good enough, I wasn't smart enough, I wasn't this, I wasn't that. And, and even though most people probably thought I was smart enough and good enough, they didn't really know that. They didn't know. They didn't know um, how many dumb thoughts I had. Yeah. How many mean-spirited thoughts I could have. Now, just because I didn't act on most of them doesn't mean I didn't have them. And I thought that in, in itself was proof that I was not good enough because I had those thoughts. That seems like the dumbest idea I ever heard now. <laughs> it's just like, what? You can't, you can't help what comes into your head. Mm -mm. Like if I just said to you, don't think of a green cow. Too late. <laughs> so that so we could say, okay, now there's something wrong with you because you <laughs> not to do that. But you didn't even think of it. You just immediately did it. Because you're just stubborn. Mm -hmm. You don't want to do what anybody tells you. Mm -hmm. No, you had you had no control over that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But once it's there. You can decide how much more time you want to spend dwelling on green cowness. Mm -hmm. So let, them, let all your thoughts come. Just, you get to decide where your attention goes. Mm -hmm. You get to decide what you want to dwell on, what you want to believe, what you want to buy, what you want to act on. You, you get to decide that. Mm -hmm. And your feelings are right there guiding you back towards being your true self and away from habits that are not in service to you. They're right there all the time. You do not have a friend that is that loyal. And you never will have. But your own makeup, your own design is just a gift from the universe. Mm -hmm. It never leaves you. You can make so much racket you can't feel it, you can't hear it. Yeah. But your your design doesn't go someplace. Hmm. The thing about that, the thing about what we pass on to people is it's none of our business whether they believe it or not. Yeah. No, none of our business at all. Because it's true anyway. <laughs> yeah. It's like I used to think it was my, when I first learned this, I thought, I gotta tell everybody this. I've gotta, I've gotta just get out there and make everybody believe. I don't know why I didn't get shot. It was just. <laughs> Like, I didn't ask permission. I didn't say, are you interested in hearing when I didn't do any of that? I just, listen, this is, this is the way it is. Oh, my God. This is important. How embarrassing. I could remember everybody that I did that to. I'd like to apologize. Pardon me. <laughs> I was just, so it took me a while to, to see that I needed to mind my own business. I needed to clean up my own attic. Mm. And um, and keep doing that the rest of my life. Mm. And pass this on as best I can to people who are actually interested in, in whose permission I asked. <laughs> <laughs> So I, I just, I think that had I not learned, I, well, I know, had I not learned about our divine engineering, I wouldn't be still doing this. I don't even know if I would have been alive mm. because years and years and years of creating unnecessary stress is really hard on our bodies. Mm. 
and I'm not sure I'd still be here if uh, maybe I would. I don't know who's who's going to know that, but it seems pretty logical to me that if I would have kept creating the all the insecurity and the self judgment and worry and all of that, if I would have kept that up, mm -hmm. I would have I would have applied too much too much pressure on my form to have been able to withstand it. And that's what we're all doing if we don't know yeah. how we're made. If we don't know that stress is a physical sensation that's basically the universe saying, shh, mm. be smarter again any minute. So I'm uh, grateful for all the things that it took to get me to the point that I got to go out to the, hear people say, it's just your thinking. Mm -hmm. And in the end, that's the same thing that happened to Sid. Yeah. He was walking along the beach with a friend and he was blathering on and on about how tough his life was. And his friends said something about, yeah, that's just your thinking. Mm -hmm. Something like that. Top of his head came off too. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when you're, you know, when I first heard him, my head was so busy trying to figure out what he was talking about that I couldn't understand him. Yeah. And I'll, you know, later on, I probably saw him, I probably saw him 50 times. It didn't take 50 times for me to get understand, because he said the same thing all the time, just like I do. I say the same thing. I don't know why people want me to keep saying the same thing, except <laughs> I do know because that's all Sid did. And he just kept saying it and saying it. And I kept kind of, quieting down more and more so that I could actually hear him. Mm. And that's, you used to say all the time, don't listen to my words, listen to my feeling. Mm -hmm. Listen to the feeling, listen to the feeling. And I think, what is that? But that's all that happened to the, my clients when I came back and said, I can't do this anymore. They felt something. And if, if you're listening right now and you're feeling something, you are feeling the same thing I know. Mm. You're feeling what you know. Yeah. Mm. I didn't put that there. You came with that. Mm. And if you're experiencing it, it's because you got quiet enough to feel it. Mm. it didn't make you quiet. I granted it's kind of hard to be noisy about some, around someone that's quiet. Yeah. But I didn't make you quiet. Mm. I didn't put what you know in there. You're made of that. I've told this, it's one of my, one of the most amazing experiences I ever had was just an ordinary experience. I had a, office for some time on the edge of downtown Minneapolis and it was across from just a beautiful park and whenever I had time I'd, I'd uh, go take a walk in the park and I had a lot of educational experiences in that park but this one day um, there was a group of, there was a group of people that were volunteers of the park and they kept kept care of the gardens and made new gardens and 
and I was going to go and check on a new garden they were making. And um, I got near it, and down the brick walkway came a mom um, pushing a stroller that she had a little infant in. And then in front of the stroller was a probably a little three-year-old girl just skipping along. And she had a bunch of little flowers cl clutched in her hand. And, I was just watching her. She's the cutest thing. And over to my right, a few yards away, was a, a, a bench. And there was a guy that was probably a homeless guy because he was kind of wearing all, all kinds of clothes and sitting with a bunch of bags around him. And he was just kind of slumped over. And just as I looked at him, this little girl looked at him. And she just stopped. And she kept looking at him. And then she walked over to him and she held out her fistful of flowers to him. And he, and I was just, I think I stopped breathing. And he, and he looked up and some tears came, came down his face and he took the flowers. And then she reached out and she just patted his knee yeah. and ran back to her mom. I don't think I have ever in my life seen such a, an example of how well we're made. Mm. A little three-year-old girl had natural compassion for a, a fellow human being, went over and gave him exactly what he needed, which is compassion mm -hmm. and love. It was just natural. It was just, just, she just saw somebody that needed something and took care of it. Yeah. And to her, I was so grateful to her mom that she let her little girl do that. Mm -hmm. But it, see, it was ordinary for this little girl. Mm -hmm. And it should be. We should see that kindness and compassion and love are the ordinary, built-in attributes of human beings. Yeah. And we just learn to bypass those or push them down and live from habit mm -hmm. with occasional bursts of compassion. Mm -hmm. But our job is to see, no, just be yourself because that's there all the time then. Okay. <sighs> <sighs> Thank you so much, Mavis. You are most welcome. And man, you are doing good work, you guys. Keep it up. It's that ripple effect that comes from just each of us deciding to be who we are. Yeah. Most powerful thing you can do. Yeah. Thank you. And it came from a walk in the park. <laughs> Isn't that awesome? It is awesome. We can blame it on the trees. <laughs> All right. Yeah, so much. Thanks for inviting me. I appreciate it. Leah, should I close us out? Please. So we really hope that you heard or felt something today. This understanding changed our lives, really. And that's possible for you as well. We hope to see you on the next My Secret Life interviews. So if you're in, keep watching and keep looking in this direction. There's, there's, there's something to see. See you on the next interviews, guys. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Bye.